As somewhat of a home lab YouTuber, it was only a matter of time before 45 Home Labs sent over one of their HL15s for me to get to build. Oh, I, I bought this. Okay, I, I bought this. I bought this HL15 so that I could build an incredible NAS to put into my home lab that I can use for. Oh wait, this isn't this isn't for my home lab. This is for something else. Why am I making this video? Okay, so yeah, this video is a little bit different because, well, I'm actually building a storage server for my previous employer, and I thought it might be fun and maybe even informative to talk through the process of picking out components and getting everything configured. I also thought this might be a good chance to check out the HL15 from 45 drives, as, well, we not only used one of them, but actually two for this project. Let me explain a bit. Before I was doing YouTube full-time, I actually worked at my church doing audio visual stuff, and when I worked there, one of the projects that I wanted to eventually get to was upgrading our NAS solution because, well, it wasn't the greatest, but it worked for a time. But over the years, the organization outgrew what they had previously, and it was time to have a proper solution for storage. The church actually produces a lot of media, and at this point I think they have multiple video editors and graphic designers, and so we needed a lot of storage for all the raw footage and photos, as well as their projects, and even for some backups for different client systems. We also wanted to have a good backup solution for that server, that way, well, they don't lose everything in case that server does go down. So where we landed was to buy two HL15s. Now, there are a lot of options out there, but we ended up landing on the HL15 for a couple of reasons. First of all, while it is pretty expensive, it's actually not as expensive as a lot of other more professional enterprise solutions. Also, the church doesn't have like a server room or anything, so we were limited to some AV racks that are only about 21 inches deep. So because of budget and space limitations, the HL15 actually ended up being a really good choice. And for the primary server, rather than doing a custom build, we just bought a system pre-configured from 45 drives with the base CPU as well as 256 gigs of RAM. Now the motherboard in that system does include 10 gig networking, and there are plans eventually to upgrade the networking in the building to have 10 gig, at least for the media team and whatnot. But as of right now, they're still stuck on gigabit, which kind of stinks, but it is what it is. At least they have a good upgrade path once they do move to 10 gig. Now for the backup system, we also went with the HL15 just because it has a lot of storage available, but could also fit within the available rack space. And to try to save some money, rather than going with a pre-configured system, we opted to buy used components off of eBay, because realistically this is just going to be a local backup of the main server. It doesn't need to be quite as reliable or have the same degree of performance. So for the second system that we're going to be building today, I purchased the HL15 without any motherboard or power supply, just the cables to connect to the backplane. Now you can buy this with a power supply, but I actually happened to have the exact power supply from an HL15 because, well, I took it out of the first server. That's because we actually opted to swap the power supply in that pre-configured system with this redundant ATX power supply from Silverstone. This thing was actually pretty cool. It has little hot swappable redundant power supplies that fit in an ATX form factor. And we opted for this on the main server just to have a little bit more reliability with that, that primary server. Now, obviously for this, we're going to need some hard drives, but I don't have any of those with me right now because they actually all got shipped to the church already because, well, we've already installed the first server. It's been running for a couple of weeks now. Now that main storage server has around 200 terabytes of usable space, which means we roughly need that same amount on the backup server to be able to back up everything. What we landed on here was purchasing 10 24 terabytes by drives that are split into two five drive VDEVs in RAID Z1. Now this does mean we can only lose one drive from each VDEV, but this is the backup server in roughly what will be a 321 backup with another copy of all their data backed up to the cloud. So really this server just exists to have a local backup in case the main server goes offline for a bit, they can keep working. Or if they do lose data off of the main server, there's at least one more copy that's local so they don't have to go start paying to fetch data off the cloud. So I feel like this was still a decent amount of reliability for this backup while also not spending a ton of money. What also helped us not spend a ton of money was going with manufacturer recertified drives from server part deals, the sponsor of today's video. Now, the cost of this whole project definitely wasn't cheap, but we still wanted to try to keep costs down as much as possible, which is why we bought the hard drives from server part deals even before I knew they were going to be a sponsor for this video. Manufacturer recertified drives can save you a lot of money that you can spend on more hard drives, higher capacity hard drives, or whatever. In fact, I did some math to figure out how much money we saved by buying manufacturer recerts versus buying new drives, and the total savings was enough to pay for this entire backup server plus a little bit extra. 
Just because you're saving money doesn't mean you're getting lousy drives either. All of the refurbished and recertified drives from server part deals go through pretty extensive testing, and they come in some of the best packaging you'll ever see. Oh, and did I mention you can get free two-day shipping on all orders? And they don't just have good deals on hard drives, they also have great deals on enterprise SSDs, and they actually have some crazy JBODs for sale now that if you're interested, I have a code down in the description where you can save $50. Whether you're looking to build out a massive JBOD with two and a half petabytes of storage, or you're just looking to pick up a couple of hard drives for your Jellyfin server, make sure to head on over to server part deals by using my link down in the description. Okay, so that's the case, the power supply, and the hard drives, but what about the rest of the system? Now, like I've said, this is just going to be a backup system, so we don't need it to have crazy performance or anything, but we did want something that was going to be reliable, expandable, and have remote management, which is why I went with this motherboard from Supermicro. Now, I can't remember the model number off the top of my head. It's probably on screen somewhere, but this is a pretty standard Socket 2011 V3 ATX motherboard that will support Haswell and Broadwell E5 Xeons. Now, unlike the primary server, this doesn't have any onboard 10 gig, but if they do want to add in 10 gig networking down the road, there's plenty of PCIe expandability, so they could easily drop in like a little SFP Plus card and be good to go. For the CPU, I went with the cheapest option possible, which is a CPU I already just had sitting in a drawer, which is an Intel E5 2620v4. Now, this is only an 8 core chip with a 2.1 gigahertz base clock, but even that's probably going to be overkill because, once again, this is just a backup. It's not going to be doing a whole lot. I also picked up 64 gigs of registered DDR4 ECC memory because we don't need a ton for ZFS caching because this isn't going to be the primary server that they're actually accessing files off of. But if the main server does go down and they do have to fall back to using this temporarily, I wanted them to have at least some amount of our caching available. To keep the CPU nice and cool, I picked up the Noctua NH-U9DXI4, which once again is probably a bit overkill, but there's not a ton of options available for Socket 2011. Now the motherboard does come with 10 SATA ports, but we're going to need at least 15 for all of the drive bays. So I also grabbed this LSI HBA, which is flashed to IT mode, which should be perfect for running TrueNAS. Oh, I don't think I even mentioned this. For both the main server and the backup, we're going to be using TrueNAS scale because, well, it's free, but it still offers plenty of features and options that will work perfectly for them. And it's also what I'm familiar with, so it's going to be easier for me to get configured and also train them on how to tweak settings and such. For boot drives, I just picked up two cheap Team Group SATA SSDs, and while I could mount them inside the case, that way they have five more hard drive bays available for expansion down the road, for now I'm just going to install them in those bays so we don't have to deal with any more cables. And to do that, I'm going to use some 3D printed caddies that I forgot to print until this morning, so if they're still on the 3D printer, they should be done here in just a little bit. And I think that's pretty much all the parts. I think first let's start by putting together the motherboard, making sure all of those components work, and then we can start putting everything inside the HL15. All right, so I've got it all assembled and it worked without any issues. No tweaking, no troubleshooting. So that's a good sign. All right, so we've got our motherboard all put together. We have the HL15, time to start getting it all put together. And I think the first thing I'm going to start with is the power supply. And before I put this power supply in, you'll notice that I have these four little connectors. Cause like I said, this was the power supply that came out of the other HL15. They go from the little SATA outputs on the power supply to just a single Molex connector. And that's to connect to this little power delivery board behind the back plane. All right, so I got the power supply in and as you can see, those little cables just go right across to those Molex headers to power all of the drives. All right, next up is the motherboard. And for that, I need to install these little standoffs, but they're kind of weird. They're just little cylinders with threads on both sides. Typically with standoffs, they'll be like hexagonal. So you can use a little driver to like really get them in nice and snug. That way they don't try to come out with the motherboard screws. So I guess I'm just gonna try to screw these on as tight as I can and hope for the best. 20 minutes later. Okay, so I was gonna try to film all of the building inside this and such, but I realized I don't have the best setup out here. Maybe I should have recorded this on my workbench with the top-down camera, my bad. Still, I should have plenty of B-roll to kind of show you what happened. And honestly, there's not a whole lot going on. Because this backplane exists, uh, a lot of the connections are just very simplified. There's that little power delivery board, which really helps. And then we really just have these four cables coming in, well, two mini SAS cables coming into the HBA, and then the SATA breakout cables going to the SATA ports. And then really, besides the power connectors and the, the power button cable, there's not a whole lot else really going on here. Now, one thing I will say about the HL15 that I noticed when, when building it is, 
It's really easy, I think, to imagine this as being a big case because it holds 15 hard drives and a full-size ATX motherboard and all, but uh, it is actually really compact, which makes sense because it has to fit within, you know, standard 19-inch rack spacing. But it's actually pretty tight to work inside, and there's not a whole lot of places to really run cables, but like I said, fortunately, there's not that many cables you really have to run. Ooh, I have one other thing I almost forgot. Hold on. So this HBA can get pretty hot, and while with the six fans, there is a lot of airflow going through the HL15, there might not be quite as much air being forced through the heatsink on the card as there would be in a more traditional server. So to make sure that HBA doesn't get too hot, I actually picked up this little bracket off of Amazon, and you might have noticed I only used one of the fans on the not too cooler, and that's so that I can attach this fan to this bracket. And now I have this little uh, PCIe bracket that I can put in here to directly blow some air right on this heatsink. And yeah, it's a little bit janky, but I didn't 3D print it, so it's not quite as janky. So this little tab's bumping into the power button, so I'm just gonna, you know, bend it down like that. Oh, this, that is really cheap paint. Okay, maybe this is more sketchy than just 3D printing it. Okay, we have a fan. It's not quite lined up where I would want it to be to push air right on that heat sink, but it still should be better than nothing, I guess. I don't know, we'll see. So really all now that's left are the hard drives, which are at the church where we'll take this tomorrow, and then the SSDs, which I think the caddies for those just finished 3D printing. All right, so these are honestly kind of interesting. They're they're very bulky. They're not like as uh, thin and flimsy as uh, you would typically expect. And they should just uh, be able to slide right in here. But first I obviously need to screw in an SSD. Let's see if it slides in. Did I put it backwards? I put it backwards. Why don't I ever think things through? I should know better. Especially because I'm doing all of this on camera for everyone to see and point and laugh and make fun of me. I mean, I guess technically I could just edit all of that out. All right, I screwed it in the right way first time. And that works pretty well. Nice and snug. Okay, so I've got everything hooked up. I have my two SSDs, but I also dropped in a few of the hard drives so we can just make sure that all of these cables are gonna work. And actually I just not realized. I should probably move this one over. That way we're testing one cable with these four drives, another cable with these four drives, another cable with this drive, and then we have the last little breakout with our boot SSDs. And now we should be able to turn it on. All the fans are spinning. Hey, there we go. All right, and we have all eight of our Western Digital four terabyte drives, which means it seems to be working as expected. So I'm pretty sure we're done with the build. Right now I'm going to go ahead and install TrueNAS and get a couple of things set up, and then I'm gonna load this back up into the box it came in so we can take it to the church tomorrow morning. All right, we made it here to the church. I forgot my camera, so I'm having to do this all on my phone, so uh, sorry about that. I've got the server right here ready to go, and then right below the main server, we already have the rack rails installed for the second server. We're gonna get it dropped into place, and there it is. Now I just need to get all of these hard drives in here. You wanna help me, Timothy? Yeah. And here goes drive number one. Two very boring minutes later. And 10. So easy. Right, Timothy? Right. After getting all of the drives in, I got the server set up and configured without any issues, but you might be wondering why I'm already sitting here at home and not setting things up. And that's because before doing any of this, I set up a computer on their network running tail scale. That way, if they need any issues or there's some troubleshooting I have to do, I can use that PC as an exit node. That way I can pretty easily hop on and make any tweaks to their servers. And so that's what I did. I got the backup server configured to have all of their users and permissions. And then using some periodic snapshots I had already set up on the data sets for the main server, I set up some rep application tasks to move all of those snapshots over to the backup server. This is actually really easy to do, especially if you follow this video from Tom Lawrence. He goes into a lot of great detail on how to set up replication tasks and some of the issues you might run into. It's definitely worth watching if you're interested in setting up a second TrueNAS server to have as a backup. And as you can see here, we have replication tasks going for both this content data set and the media data set. And that probably will take a while because they're still on just gigabit because, well, we do have two gigabit ports that we're going to be setting up in a lag, but their IT person wasn't around to set up the second LACP configuration. So right now it's just limited to a single gigabit connection. So those transfers are taking a while, but eventually we'll be able to get it up to uh, dual one gigabit connections. And then hopefully later on down the road, they'll upgrade to some 10 gig networking. And so we can get things even faster. But yeah, all in all, I feel like this solution with the two HL15s is working pretty well. They've been using that main server now for probably like 
two or three weeks and they've been slowly migrating all of their data and workflows over to it. And they say it's been working great. And so far, for at least a few hours it's been running, the new backup server is working great as well. Now, I know some of you might be concerned that we have these two copies of their data right next to each other, but we are going to be working on getting a cloud backup solution. That way, if there is a natural disaster or something that wipes out that entire rack, they should have another copy of their data offsite. In my opinion, the HL15 or HL15s were a great solution for this problem, as we didn't have a lot of rack space, so we needed something pretty compact, and they had those 15 drive bays for plenty of storage. Now, obviously, if you're just a home user, spending $1,000 on a case would not be considered a budget-friendly option. There definitely are much cheaper options, but like I said, I think the HL15s really worked well in this specific instance. They seem really happy with it. It seems to be working well. And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know down in the comments if, if you think I did something dumb or could have done something better. I always like to learn, especially if uh, I'm helping other people set up servers, which I don't think I'll be doing a lot of, but this was a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoyed watching. If you did, maybe consider liking, subscribing, or signing up as a RAID member for as little as a dollar a month to get early access to ad-free videos. It's pretty cool, maybe check it out. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.